Welcome to World History. Today we're going to continue our discussion of absolutism by moving over to England, which took somewhat of a different path from France and Russia. So, but without further ado, let's jump in and explain why these two dogs are growling at each other. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify the reasons for conflict between the King of England and Parliament, evaluate the forces that led Parliament to win the Civil War, and then evaluate, analyze the effect of the English Revolution, how much actually changed in England based on all the events we're going to talk about today. So something you need to understand about England that was different from either France or Russia is England had already somewhat limited the powers of their kings. They didn't operate, although they believed in divine right, the kings did not have the same type of power because they were limited by a document called the Great Charter or the Magna Carta. This had been signed in 1215 by King John of England. But what we ended up seeing is power was shared between the king and a group of nobles, mostly, called Parliament. Parliament was the one who gave the king the money in order to do the things he wanted to do. So although the king had almost unlimited power to do stuff, he was limited because without money, how much can you really get done? And so because of this, the people of England already sort of had a check on the power of the king, which means this story is going to unfold very differently from our other two stories that we've looked at. Our story begins with Charles I. Charles I got into several disagreements with his parliament over the issue of, of course, money. He would call parliament and ask for money, and they would tell him no. And he would call Parliament and he would ask for money and they would tell him no, and so he would dissolve Parliament. And so Charles decided to never call another Parliament and looked for a whole bunch of other ways to try to get money that did not involve Parliament. So he tried all of these sort of ways to get around the fact that the king had no right to actually raise taxes. This created a lot of conflict between the king and parliament because all of these things were technically illegal under English law, but Charles was doing them anyway. This led to a whole series of problems and lots of tension between Charles and parliament. So, all this tension finally boiled to a head when Charles got himself very unfortunately involved in a series of different expensive wars that he desperately needed money for. So why did Charles get involved in a whole bunch of different wars? He got involved in wars, especially with the Scots, because he tried to force everyone to be the same religion. As you hopefully remember from previous lectures, Queen Elizabeth had basically decided to look the other way and allow the English to go their own way and basically choose whatever form of Protestantism they wanted and even, you know, allowed some Catholicism. Well, Charles sort of subscribed to the whole Louis thing that a king should have, that a kingdom should have only one religion. And so he and his friend, the Archbishop William Laud, started trying to force the Scottish people to accept the English way of worshiping. This led to an immediate revolt. Here we see angry Scottish women throwing things at their bishop and eventually provoked a war between Scotland and England. So now that he's at war, Charles desperately needs money. And so the only way that he can really get money is he has to call parliament. So this begins what's called the long parliament because this is the parliament that's gonna be sitting throughout the entire civil war. So Charles calls parliament. He demands that they give him money, he refu they refuse, and in the end, both sides start raising their own separate armies in order to try to go to deal with this problem. So Parliament is going to raise an army, and Charles is going to raise his own army, both of them to theoretically go and fight and finish this war. But now that both sides have their own private army, they look at each other and realize, well, maybe we have someone closer that we should be fighting. This leads to the English civil wars. 
this is a really interesting period in history, and I honestly wish we had more time to get into it, but quite frankly, we don't. Just know that the civil wars were, began, were between the royalists, or Charles's forces, and the parliamentarians, or parliament's forces. They fought a series of battles all over England. In the beginning, it seemed like Charles had the upper hand, because quite frankly, he had better trained troops. And so in the early years, Charles was winning, or at least seemed like he might win the English Civil Wars. But over time, as the war dragged on, Charles's advantage of having a better trained and better organized army started to dissipate because Parliament created a new army organized on new sort of modern military principles led by a guy named Sir Thomas Fairfax. And this new, much better organized parliamentary army then started to push back and defeat Charles. At the, uh, at the climatic Battle of Naseby, which you don't need to know, Charles's army was smashed and Parliament was victorious in the Civil War. Charles, now a captive of Parliament, was offered a chance to sign away a lot of his powers and to basically go back to being or to start being a ruler who was more of a figurehead. So he had this option to uh, give up most of his power, but Charles refused. He argued that he was a king that was un ordained by God. He had this divine right to rule and he was not going to step down. And so therefore Charles was executed after a short trial where he was found guilty of crimes against his own people and power instead passed to one of the leaders of this new model army, a guy named Oliver Cromwell. And so what we end up getting is the rule of Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector. He ruled as a sort of king, And Oliver Cromwell kept trying to come up with a new form of government in which he would share power with a parliament, but he kept having the same disagreements with parliament that the king had. And so in the end, he basically divided England up into a series of military districts And each of them was put in charge, a general was put in charge of each one of them. And the English, the new model army ruled England for the rest of Oliver Cromwell's life. Oliver Cromwell followed a very strict form of Christianity known as Puritanism. This was a Calvinist group and they believed of course in predestination. And so much like Calvinists Geneva, we have during the rule of Oliver Cromwell, they passed strict laws banning all types of sinful behavior, including most famously the celebration of Christmas. So by the time Oliver Cromwell died, everyone was pretty much sick of his rule and decided that they wanted things to go back to the way that they had been before. Oliver Cromwell tried to put his son on the throne, but the people of England rejected him. And instead they invited back Charles II, the son of the deposed King Charles I. So England is now a monarchy again, and they've got a king back on the throne, and it seems like everything is going to be okay. But then exactly the same thing happened again. The next king, James II, again started trying to force religious or force everyone to be the same religion. And the people rose up again. This time, no one rallied to James's defense, and he was not able to make his own army. And so James fled the country. And instead, we brought in two new monarchs, William and Mary. William and Mary agreed to abide by what was called the English Bill of Rights, which significantly limited their power. and England became what's called a constitutional monarchy. Which means that there is a king, but again, his power is very strictly limited by a series of things that the king cannot do.
and a series of rights that the people have that the king cannot take away from them. And so whereas in France and Russia, we see the power of kings growing substantially, but in England, we see the power of kings decreasing because parliament was able to win the civil war and force the kings to sign documents that limited their power. So this brings us back to our objectives. Hopefully you can provide some detail here as to how the conflict between Charles and parliament started the factors that led Parliament to win, and how the English Revolution changed English society.